uh, where do we leave off? We left off at the end of making some lovely arrays of qubits and things, which is all well and jolly. There are other kinds of qubits as well, um, and you can not just have not just want to do spin one half qubits, but you can make pseudo spin one half molecular qubits using lanthanides. And I know a lot of people deal with lanthanide -lant electronic structure, um, and it is complicated. I have a lot of fun stuff I want to get to, so I'm not going to dwell too much on this. Feel free to ask me afterwards if you want to know more about lanthanide -lant electronic structure, and we can. Talk to we're blue in the face about it. Um, but they're special in terms of the periodic table in the sense that the 4F orbitals are shielded by these filled 5S and 5P orbitals, which do all the bonding stuff. So the 4S orbitals tend to act uh, very much like their atomic equivalents, even when you put them in molecules. And the result of that is that your crystal field splitting, if you come from a chemistry background, uh, is very, very weak. So unlike the 3D orbitals, which split appreciably and dictate high low spin electron configurations, um, you more or less have the same free iron-like uh, orbital angular momentum and various things, and you can play fun games with this. Uh, but it also means that your electronic structure is strongly correlated. We heard from um, Anna over the last couple of days about electronic structure theory, uh, and basically the point is you cannot write a single determinant for the ground states of these things. You need incredibly long expansions, and so you need explicitly multi-determinental electronic structure theories if you want to describe it. Uh, again, ask me later if you want to know more about that. And also spin orbit coupling is a non-negligible perturbation. We have it in the ground state. It scales as the, um, with, the, with the, um, uh, the size, of the, the mass of the nucleus. Uh, and so for the lanthanides, which are rather heavy, this is important. And we also have a first order orbital contribution to the magnetic moment. And so this is not negligible. And so generally speaking, this hierarchy of electronic structure uh, up until here is all gas phase ionic you know, structure that Conant and Shortly mapped out over 100 years ago, right? Um, so the, the 4F uh, interelectronic repulsion splits your configuration into uh, these terms, and so these are Russell Saunders terms with a well-defined total spin and a well-defined total orbital angular momentum. That is then spit, split by the spin orbit coupling into these total uh, J angular momentum multiplets. Uh, okay, so J is a good quantum number, but once you put a, a 4F ion into a molecule, you make, you, you reduce the symmetry from uh, the, the gas phase, which is the spherical symmetry, into something that is very low symmetry, and as far as I'm concerned, it can be C1, I don't care. Um, you split these multiplets into various ligand field or crystal field states, uh, and that's where all the fun happens. And so if you have a Kremers um, uh, non-integer spin system, so for instance, uh, this is for a dysprosium, you have a spin 5 over 2 ground state, uh, and so you will always have effective spin 1 half states, so doubly degenerate Kramer's doublets um, in zero magnetic field. And so you can use the ground pair of these as an effective or pseudo spin 1 half if you want to do some kind of quantum uh, information or qubity thing. So here's an example, a terbium trensal. This is uh, Ytterbium 3, which is F13, so it has one hole in the F shell, and so you get a doublet F ground uh, Russell Saunders term after spin orbit coupling. The lowest total angular momentum state is 7 over 2, and so this is your ground multiplet for this thing here. This is a nice molecule, it's neutral, it can sublime, it can do all kinds of fun stuff. Um, it has a very well defined uh, structure, it's got a C3 point group symmetry in the solid state, and so the crystal field Hamiltonian here, which is the Stevens notation, if anyone's seen that before, but essentially this is just a spherical harmonic decomposition in terms of the symmetry for the environment of the molecule, which impacts the orbital degrees of freedom, which projects onto the total angular momentum, which gives you the reduction of symmetry. And so these terms here are what you need to describe uh, the crystal field splitting of this molecule in the C3 group, uh, and you can measure exactly where these points are with either luminescence or absorption spectroscopy, and you can, can fit all of these together to get um, a, re a, a reduction in the number of parameters to, to actually model what these all are, so this is all well known. And if you do EPR spectroscopy at very low temperatures, you can measure the effective G values of this ground pseudo spin one half, and you can see that the G values are very, very far from two. And this occurs because this is not a pure spin state. This is not just S. This is essentially some linear combination of MJ projections. So the total angular momentum, it's all mixed up thanks to the reduction of symmetry here. So they're all um, uh, mixed up, but it's mixed up in a well-known way. And these give rise to these effective G values that can be crazy. So in this case, you can see that they are axially symmetric, and that comes because this molecule has axial symmetry. OK? 
Okay? And so if you do your EPR spectrum, you can take a crystal and put your magnetic field parallel to this, the, 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 the crystalline C3 axis, and you get a resonance line over here. Or if you put it perpendicular to the C3 axis, you get a resonance line over here at a different magnetic field for a fixed frequency. Okay, so this is what we were talking about before, but now borne out uh, in, in single crystals. Ytterbium, uh, in its natural abundance, uh, you know, so we haven't enriched anything, it has 14% uh, 171, which is a spin 1 half nucleus, and it has 16% 173 ytterbium, which is a spin 5 over 2 nucleus. And so that's what all these wiggles are on the sides of this central resonance line. So the central line here is the I0, which is, what's that, uh, 30, so 70% of your sample has spin nucleus spin 0, so that's your central line. And then these ones are your hyperfine split um, ytterbium resonances. Okay. So I think on the next slide, I have a picture of all of that. Yep, so this is lovely work from the Copenhagen group, uh, measured also in Manchester for some of these experiments. Uh, and so this is your total Hamiltonian here. So you have the crystal field. So this is all after we've done all of the free ion stuff. So we've done all of the um, Coulomb stuff. We've done all of the electronic repulsion to get out Russell Saunders terms. We're then down in the basis of a total angular momentum. So J is the quantum number we start with. We apply our crystal field, which splits the degeneracy of our J-manifold into Kramer's doublets. They're all mixed up, right? They're not nice eigenstates of MJ anymore. Um, they are actually in C3. They are, without the magnetic field, irreps of the C3 point group. So they correspond to those symmetry classes if you are interested in that. But then we have the hyperfine coupling. So we have the, the total angular momentum, which couples by the hyperfine interaction to the nuclear spin. We have a magnetic field that impacts our electron spin. Uh, that should be a J, sorry. Uh, and then we have a nuclear, uh, the nuclear magnetic interaction. Okay, and so that's our Hamiltonian, and you get all these beautiful lines as a function of magnetic field. But of course, these are anisotropic, so it depends on the orientation of your magnetic field. So here we have uh, B0, which is the external field along the C3 axis of the crystallite. So this is a little graphic that in indicates these crystals. They're actually beautiful. They grow like pencils. Right, so long rods with these hexagonal sides. So you can really easily do a single crystal experiment. And these are air stable, they're lovely things. And they luminesce, I showed that on the first thing. So you can shine UV light on them and you get all the spectra that gives you, tells you where all the crystal field levels are. It's beautiful. Right, so this is with the magnetic field parallel to the symmetry axis, and so you get this kind of nice splitting. Um, and this is just indicating where some of the resonances are at the different hyperfine lines for a given uh, nuclear spin. And so here we have the branching of this, this central line, which is the I0 line, but of course as you hyperfine couple to your spin half, that's these two lines out here, now these two magnetic fields, and then your 5 over 2 lines are the smaller ones spread over there. Okay, that was a lot, I know, but I'm trying to go quickly because this is just one example in among many. Any questions on ytterbium <laughs> at this point? Okay. Right, so complicated electronic structure, compl complicated molecular structure, complicated EPR spectra. But it's cool. You can do phase memory experiments, echo experiments on these things, right? And you can pick whichever hyperfine line you like uh, and do this, okay? And so this is looking at a, a TM, a phase coherence time, on the order of some microsecond or so, which is perfectly fine if you are happy doing nanosecond pulses. This, again, has to be quite low temperature in this case to get uh, to see what you want. Okay. Right, and this is the picture that I showed much earlier in the first, in the first part. This is looking at mutation experiments or Rabi oscillations on this sample in the solid state. This is 7% ytterbium diluted into lutetium. And here we're looking at different uh, MI transitions. So, these are, so, the, so the EP oscillation rule is you're changing your electron spin, which is mapped onto the total angular momentum J. So you're changing delta MJ by plus or minus 1. And in the ground electronic doublet, this is an allowed EPR transition. There's no problems because they're all mixed up, so it's all fine. But we can do that on, a, on different lines of fixed MI. So pr the projection of the nuclear spin does not change when you do an EPR transition, unless you do off-resonant stuff. I'm not talking about that. Um, and so these, these are oscillations looking at different magnetic fields, which are addressing different nuclear spin transitions in your sample. Okay, so we're doing, we're doing electron spin flips for a fixed nuclear spin projection. And you, you can see they're all coherent. There are some different ones that have slightly less, and that's actually quite interesting, but I won't go into that today. Okay. All right. So why do other spins in the environment lead to decoherence? Wes talked about this on day one, so I hope you can remember. 
the time evolution of your sample, so the precession of your electron spins, is perturbed by magnetic field noise, right? So, and that's just because if you have your energy states that are wiggling in time, the, the, the relative phase between those states will wiggle in time. And that screws up what you want to do, right, with your electron spin. Uh, and so in EPR, the way we think about this is that the transition frequency is dependent on the magnetic field. So if we think about some, some lines out here and we're looking at some uh, resonant microwave energy here in our Zeeman splitting, then the transition frequency is linearly dependent. And so if we have wiggles in the magnetic field, right, from noise in the environment, that will dictate or induce wiggles in our transition frequency. And so that's going to mess with the precession and the natural free evolution of whatever we're trying to do coherently and therefore mess it up. Okay? But you can get around that if you operate um, somewhere else. So aside from getting rid of noise in the environment, how do you reduce the impact? And the way to do that is to operate at a clock transition. So we, you will have heard about probably clock transitions in terms of atomic clocks and you know, frequency standards and all these things. In the general sense, all that means is a, is a transition that's very stable, right? And so in this context of EPR, the avoided crossing in the middle here, right, where we have this bending of the energy levels, gives you to first order a derivative of zero at the energy splitting, right at the middle, okay? So here at this clock frequency, it is the frequency that you're at is to first order insensitive to noise in the magnetic field, okay? So some oscillation in the magnetic field doesn't have nearly as much impact on the transition frequency. And so if you can be on resonant with this very specific energy for your EPR manipulation, then you are impervious to the noise in your environment, which is quite nice. So there are some examples. So this is lovely work uh, done, well, the, the synthesis originally came from uh, the Valencia group, Eugenio Coronado and co, um, many years ago. Okay, and this is a holmium polyoxometalate. So these black uh, tetrahedra are your, sorry, not tetrahedra, octahedra, are your uh, tungsten ions that are surrounded by oxygens. Okay, so this is called a polyoxometalate cluster. And these things are big, bulky, chunks of rock, kind of, if you think of them like that, um, but they function as really nice ligands, right? So these have four oxygens that protrude at the bottom. You can see this little square, so there are your tungstens, four oxygens that sit down, and if you get two of these together, you can sandwich a lanthanide in the middle. It's just the right size to hold one in the center. So that's what we have. We have two polyoxometalate fragments surrounding one metal ion. And in this case, it's holmium in the center, and, and this has a terribly negative or anionic charge because these big lumps are very negatively charged. And so you have lots of counter ions, counter cations, around this thing somewhere, okay? In the crystal structure, there's also a heck of a lot of water floating around in these things. Right, that does cause problems, but let's not worry about that for the moment. So holmium-3, in this case, is 4F10. That gives you a 5I8 ground multiplet, which again is split by the crystal field of its uh, non-spherical symmetry environment, in this case, and it's close to the D4D point group. And so here we have this sort of square antiprism. So we have two squares of oxygens that are twisted at about 45 degrees, respect to top and bottom. So this is what's called D4D. And this is actually really nice because if it is perfect in D4D, you actually have only the axial crystal field terms, which means you have perfect MJ state quantization. And so it turns out that you get MJ pairs are your eigenstates. Okay? And so this... Um, gives you in this compound something that looks very much like an Mj plus or minus 4 ground doublet. However, this thing isn't perfectly D4D, right? This angle is not perfectly 45 degrees. Those planes are not perfectly planar. There's all kinds of lowering of symmetry. So this thing is C1, really. And as I said, there's water everywhere, and that breaks your symmetry. Okay, so this is not enforced rigorous D4D. And so there are other terms that switch on. Right? And the leading term is this other one here, this 4-4 type thing. And that comes from this, this thing not being 45 degrees but being slightly skewed. You still have a fourfold symmetry axis, but you lose your reflection plane or your dihedrals. Okay? So you lower the symmetry a little bit, you turn on this term, and because holmium is not a chromazine, it has an even number of unpaired electrons, you no longer are restricted by the Kramer's symmetry theorem. And so in zero magnetic field, your states can be singly degenerate. They can be non-degenerate, right? And that's exactly what happens, is that the deviations from this high symmetry split this pseudo MJ equals plus minus four ground state into non-degenerate 
electronic states at very, very small energy gaps. It also turns out that for fun and games, holmium has 100% abundant nuclear spin 7 over 2, and so you then have a hyperfine coupling that switches on. Okay? And so now you have a Hamiltonian that includes crystal field effects, um, the, the hyperfine interaction, again, that should be a J there, sorry folks, uh, electron spin coupling to the magnetic field, and nuclear spin coupling to the magnetic field. And so if you do that without the hyperfine coupling, or sorry, without this off symmetry term here, you get these lovely hyperfine levels and you can predict where you think these transitions should be, but they're not there when you measure them. It turns out they are actually off by some point, and that's because you open a gap, right? And this gap opens due to this lowering of symmetry. This is the splitting of your electronic doublet in zero magnetic field by a low symmetry perturbation. And it just so turns out that this splitting is right on the order of nine and a bit gigahertz. So it's right in your X band, which means you start getting very close to zero field magnetic transitions, but you can get all of these transitions all out here. Okay? And so if you can go and do, go away and do the experiments and do your uh, pulsed EPR spectroscopy at those very specific turning points in your spectrum, you could maybe expect some enhancement of your coherence times. And that's exactly what they find. So this here is a plot of T2. Steve, thank you. So this is all now the pulse DPR here is all Steve Hill at the mag lab in Tallahassee. Um, so this is now as a function of different field units around the different resonant uh, positions for a given microwave frequency. And what you can see is as a function of those, uh, the, the magnetic field position, T2 skyrockets. So you go from something on the order of three microseconds up to eight or so. It's very, very sharp here, right in the center of these clock transitions. And that's because all of a sudden, the decoherence is not limited by magnetic noise in the environment anymore. It becomes limited by other things, which we'll get to talking about later. Okay. So the frequencies go spike up really sharp here. And this, this is just the appearance of these clock transitions. And in fact, this is diluted in the diamagnetic analog, but because of this um, insensitivity to, to magnetic noise, you can actually do it in the pure analog. So you don't have to make any separations of these magnetic ions anymore. You can keep it really condensed. Uh, and still you see these very, very sharp increases in T2. So now we're a bit lower, we're not, no longer on the several microseconds, we're at the fractions of microseconds, but still you see this very sharp enhancement. So these clock transitions are really nice if you want to be making qubits that are insensitive to magnetic field noise. And the cool thing is, this arises precisely because of chemistry, because of the structure of the molecule. If you want to make this clock transition at a bigger frequency, just increase the lower symmetry perturbation, make it bigger. Or you want to get rid of the hyperfine, okay, choose a different nuclei. Or you want to make it at a different frequency, all right, well, choose a different magnetic ion that has a different resonance position, right? You can do control so much in this Hamiltonian, right? You can control all of these parameters. So you can decide where you want the clock transitions to be, which is something that's really nice about the whole molecular qubits. That's one of the pros. We've talked about a lot of the cons, that's a pro. Right. Okay. Another advantage, of course, of molecular spins is that they are on the nanometer scale. So if you want to build billions of them, you don't need a football field. You can do it in the palm of your hand. That's great. The downside is you cannot contain a magnetic field to the scale of an individual spin or a molecule. And that's because, fundamentally, there is no such thing as a magnetic monopole. Right? That's, that's the problem. We don't have... There's always field lines that curl back, right? That's, that's the issue. Um, however, electric fields can be contained. And so here's a really nice example of scanning tunneling microscopy, where you can have an atomically precise tip, which has an electric field, which is incredibly strong, and you can use it to image single molecules. And so here you have the actual... So this is inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. Um, but you can see here these, these bright spots. That's where you're getting a tunnel current, basically. Uh, and that can be mapped onto the molecular structure at different bias potentials here. So you can actually image single molecules, right? This is great because electric fields therefore can be contained to the scale of, in this case, angstrom, which is perfect. So how can you <laughs> manipulate molecular spins with electric fields? That would be awesome. The problem is electric fields don't interact with spins, right? Again, we know this, okay? So that's a problem. But, thank goodness for the spin orbit effect, because electric fields do interact with the orbital degrees of freedom, and you can manipulate structure using electric fields. 
Okay? And that can couple via spin-orbit coupling to the spin degree of freedom. And so lanthanides are ideal for this because, of course, you have a first-order orbital angular momentum in the ground state, which couples via the spin-orbit coupling to your spin. And it's very strong. So that if you are going to use an electric field, you can directly manipulate your spin states, which is lovely. So here's an example. This is, again, looking at the, uh, this, this holmium polyoxometallate. So it's the same compound we looked at before. And this is work done with uh, Arjang Ardavan at Oxford. And what they've done is applied an electric field. And this is just showing how an applied electric field influences the structure of the molecules. Essentially, you induce a strain. The electric, because you have a, a breaking of inversion symmetry here. So you have a permanent dipole that does exist in a condensed phase. And by applying an electric field, you strain the atomic positions. By straining the atomic positions, you perturb the symmetry, you perturb the crystal field potential, and so you manipulate the eigenstates that way. And what that allows you to do is to coherently control. And so this is a pulse of electric field during the free evolution period in a Hahn echo experiment. So you do your pi half pulse, you wait some time, and during that evolution time, you are going to apply uh, an electric field pulse. And you can show that the duration of that electric field pulse is coherent. So you can coherently manipulate molecular electron spins using electric fields, which is a really nice way of going about it. So if you can design molecular qubits that are insensitive to magnetic field noise, but are very sensitive to electric field noise, you can deposit them on a surface, however you want them to be, and then you can use maybe tips or whatever you have, some kind of array or gates, maybe you think about some kind of layer, whatever it is, to turn on or turn off things that are going to be resonant with your control field. Now maybe you've got a way of starting to implement large all-to-all -all connectivity or however you want to do it. Okay? So there's a lot of, of really cool stuff in this area that is just waiting to be opened up. But it is going to require a heck of a lot of engineering and creativity to make any devices out of this stuff. But it's super cool. Okay. Right. Where are we going? Higher dimensions. OK, cool. So we've talked about single bits, single qubits. And that's fun. And it makes us think we're doing building quantum computers out of individual molecules, just like superconducting circuits are. Right. The big problem, which a lot of people ask, is how are you going to address individual bits? Or how are you going to connect gates you know, between bits? Yeah, good question. That's really hard, right? And I just talked about a way, maybe with electric fields and maybe some kind of fancy devices, and who knows? There could be a way to do that. That's really hard. If you want to build a molecule that has 12 qubits, 4 qubits, right? How do you distinguish them? How do you control the interactions? Basically, and people have tried this. There have been some, I don't know if I have, I don't think I put the slide in in the end, but there have been examples where you can maybe make two organic radicals or something, and you put a molecule in the middle that is sensitive to light. And so you can say, okay, I'm going to hit it with a pulse of light. It's going to change the structure. It's going to turn on a coupling. And then, okay, fine, great. Problem is, though, you're still doing chemistry, which takes a very, very long time and, you know, not nanoseconds to actually do this kind of gating. So that's kind of hard. So generally speaking, when you make a molecule with multiple spin centers, multiple qubits, the interaction between them is baked in. It is what it is. You can't change it, can't switch it on, can't switch it off. This is a problem. But there are ways to go about it. Okay, so ways to get around it might be take a single spin, whether it's a single molecule or a single array of molecules that you are coherently manipulating um, as, a, as an ensemble. Um, but you can put them, so this is from um, Stefano, Stefano Carretter in Parma. And maybe you put them here at these, um, these pinched resonator lines. So you have a strong uh, photon spin coupling, which has already been demonstrated. This can be tuned, the resonance of this line can be tuned with a squid in the middle here. So this is sort of a, a schematic. You can have control lines that allow you to manipulate in the individual spins. And then you have that all coupled to a, a resonant readout line. So there are ways you can think about coherently controlling the individual spins of molecules and putting them on resonance with each other, coupling them, and performing individual gates. People have been thinking about how you could do this in the device. And Stefano's group has done a lot of work in this area, so I do encourage you to read up on that. I'm not going to focus on this, OK, because this is cool and it's really not my area, though. Um, so let's talk about another way to go around it. So the alternative way of viewing this is that Molecular qubits or arrays or you know, um, agglomerates of these qubits could be considered as quantum simulators or pre-programmed 
quantum devices in the sense that you have some higher dimensional subspace which has all kinds of couplings baked in, and then you can encode in that, in that Hamiltonian, the problem you want to solve. So design a molecule that mimics the Hamiltonian that you want to solve. And then initialize, run it, read it out to solve exactly using the free evolution of the quantum states of your molecule, the problem that you can't pose in reality. So this is called quantum simulation or, or, or whatever you want it, and it exploits higher dimensional subspaces. And so this is commonly called Q dits D being the higher dimensionality than just the bit binary two. So Q dits can have arbitrary dimensions. And so here, for example, is a, uh, a lanthanide uh, dimetallic here. So this is from um, Guillermo Romi's group in uh, Barcelona. Uh, and so here we have these two lanthanide ions which are uh, not the same, cerium and erbium. These are both Kramers ions, so their ground states are both doubly degenerate. But of course, between these, within one molecule, there is some magnetic interaction between the two via dipole, via um, the, the uh, super exchange, all kinds of stuff, which splits the degeneracy of that, that four-dimensional subspace into four levels. And of course, you can assign these four levels arbitrarily to whatever basis states you want to call them. And so in some non-zero magnetic field here, or well, this could be in zero field, it doesn't matter, you have some separation. These frequencies are different colors, right? So if you wanted, it could be possible to address all these different transitions and do whatever kind of two qubit gates or single qubit gates you like. And so here's an example of them proposing this indeed. And so we were, someone was asking before about C not gates or, or whatever root I swap gates. That's really not my bag. Ask someone who knows what they're talking about uh, there. But if, you know, if you're assigning your basis states between these eigenfunctions and you, do, you can do magnetic resonance experiments, you can think about issuing pulses that will hit this transition but not this one. Or maybe you could use a different color and hit this one here. Okay? That's the idea. Uh, and that's really nice. Right? So EPR could do this on molecules and it would be perfect. There are problems and we might talk about them a bit later. Please ask if you have questions about this. But the real big thing here is, you can see the energy scale is gigahertz, okay, electron spins. Uh, and the problem is, with EPR, we do not have a way of issuing a 9 gigahertz pulse and then a 40 gigahertz pulse uh, right <laughs> in the same device with the same power to do these gates. The bandwidth isn't there in either the source, the detector, the resonator, nothing. So that's the problem, is instrumental capability holds us back. Okay? This is all different if you're talking about NMR because you're on very, very narrow frequency bands and you can do whatever you want. EPR is a lot harder. Uh, I have a question. How do you do these, uh, these transitions, like to allow some transitions and some transitions that uh, do you use selection rules? Or what do you do for like, having a specific transitions that you want to do and what right. not to do? So in this particular case, here you have two lanthanides in very low symmetry environments that have a different character with then anisotropic electron coupling between the two. So basically, these are eigenstates of only the Hamiltonian. <laughs> they are not eigenstates of anything. They are mixed crazily, right? So there will be an EPR transition allowed between all of them. You can see that, right? This is the, the EPR intensity. There's, there's intensity all over the place. So that's, the selection rule isn't the problem. Here, the addressability would be in the frequency space, is that these are all at different frequencies for any magnetic field for some orientation. I mean, maybe you could find a field that was problematic where they were you know, degeneracies in terms of the frequencies, um, but you could always then just change the orientation of the field. But the problem there is that you are, the bandwidth is huge. And you could say, oh, we'll go to low field. Okay, well, that's fine. You can press all of your transitions into a narrow band, but now you have to have sharp enough lines that you can actually hit them within the bandwidth of your spectrometer. So this all comes down to practicalities in the end. I mean, if we had perfect instrumentation that could do whatever we wanted, then on paper, qubits win, right? Molecular qubits, sorry, win, hands down. But we don't, and that's the problem, hardware and actual implementation. My experience again, why you need to exploit the higher dimensions to do these quantum simulators? What's wrong with just a, a single qubit? I mean, not a single qubit. Um, you don't have to. Yeah. The, the, the point is you can, right? So because we can control arbitrarily the size of a molecule, the number of its electronic degrees of freedom, if we want to have it coupled to nuclear spins, this is all controllable. And so the Hamiltonian that de defines the electronic states and the 
uh, you know, that you can play with here is at your whim. You can make it whatever you want. Write it on a piece of paper and we'll try and make it, right? That, that's the idea. Which is hard to do in any other way unless you have a very complicated network of connected qubits that have arbitrary mappings, which is, of course, the goal, right, of a universal quantum computer. But that's, you know, with the fidelity that you need to do it, that becomes hard to do things completely arbitrarily. But on the other side, if you come from chemistry, well, let's write down what you want and let's see what we can make, you know? It's possible that that's an easier way of going about the problem, depending on what you want to do. Yeah? How easy is to control, like, the Teslas of your, of your, like, of your, of your magnet? Like, uh -huh. can you just sweep the Teslas? Yep, so that's the other way. And I think, mm, it's not on the next slide, it's coming up. There's an example where people say, hey, look, over here's a, the, the C not gate, and over here's the I swap gate. They differ by about a Tesla. You're not going to be changing a Tesla of magnetic field on the nanosecond timescale. And, and remember, as you do that, you are then changing the Zeeman energy. <laughs> so you're changing your Hamiltonian, right? So your precession is all going to change. Now, if you could do it all coherently, yeah, maybe. But you're not changing Teslas on a nanosecond timescale with enough control that it's coherent. Maybe very small magnetic field changes, sure, but not what you need to bring transitions in and out of resonance on the gigahertz scale. So that, another technological problem. Again, on paper, it works fine, right? Magnetic field pulse, <laughs> gradient pulse. That's what they do in NMR, right? And it works beautifully because they're not changing the field by much because they don't have to because it's megahertz. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you don't just have to make dimers, right, of spin one halves, you could, or whatever, you could build uh, single magnetic sites that have higher degrees of freedom. So for instance, we've talked about copper, that's a spin one half, but you can think about an octahedral nickel, that's a spin one, octahedral chromium is a spin three over two, iron is five over two, if you do gadolinium, you've got seven over two. So you've got a lot of spin degrees of freedom that you can play with, and these give you corresponding dimensions of your q dits. okay? And so the question is then, how do you distinguish all of these states? I'm going to go through this a bit because there's other stuff I want to get to, but um, basically what we have in, an, in, a, in a molecule is the orbitals, the d orbitals are spit, split for a d compound uh, into our uh, T2g and EG levels in an octahedron, and this defines our low spin, high spin configurations. Okay, this is our ground state crystal field diagrams. Uh, I was going to go through, do, do people want me to go through Tanabe Sugano diagrams and things like that? You probably don't even know what that is. Is that a yes? Oh, I got a yes at the back. I'll do it. So we have a tool that we wrote. Um, I hope this works. Oh. oh, it's loading. OK. So I wanted to do this so that I could show everyone. Why is nothing working? Oh, it's not loading. Oh, it's in the, take, follow the link in the, in the um, I don't know why it's not loading. Anyway, we have a tool here uh, that's follow the hyperlink, but it allows you to look at the Tanabe Sinagano diagrams for arbitrary spin systems. And basically, what this tells you is how to control um, how you can control the ligand field splitting to give you a certain ground state and excited states you want. Okay, and so this this will become useful, relevant when we're talking about um, the work from Dana Friedman. Okay, so basically, what happens though is the reason you have uh, addressability in your multiple spin degrees of freedom is because we have a zero field splitting of our ground state. So even though in this case of a chromium octahedron, we have three unpaired electrons in our ground orbitals, if we have an excited state, which you always have excited states, right, that has now an orbital degeneracy here, I could put this hole wherever I wanted, that is mixed into our ground state. And although it's dominated by, um, uh, say here, the quartet A, which is the spin three over two, there is some part of a quartet T, which means it has anisotropy. Uh, and so basically the effect there is to map onto our spin ground state some anisotropy. And this is called the zero field splitting in EPR. Uh, and, and so we have modeled this with an effective spin Hamiltonian. Okay, so this is the effective zip spin Hamiltonian for a zero field splitting. D is a traceless second rank tensor. And you can, because it's traceless, you can always rewrite it in terms of these two things here, these two zero field splitting parameters, D and E. And so you will often see the Hamiltonian written equivalently uh, like this, okay? And so the D term is called the axial zero field splitting, and it splits your S manifold into MS eigenstates. 
and E is your rhombic zero field splitting, and it mixes your eigenstates with delta ms plus or minus 2, and that's from these squared operators. So just for an example, here is a spin 3 over 2 system, uh, so say an octahedral chromium center, uh, and if it has an isotropy, which it always will, um, this is an example of what you might have in terms of your manifold. So someone was asking about how you write uh, spin Hamiltonian and how you convert that to an EPR spectrum. So your zero field Hamiltonian would be this D and E term. So that gives you these red and blue things in your four dimensional three over two subspace. You then add a magnetic field and this is the case of a magnetic field along the Z direction. But if my molecule is rotated with respect to the external magnetic field, well then I just put a BX term or a theta and a BY or whatever I need to do, right? And so then you have matrix elements that pop up in different places here, which means once you diagonalize this, you get eigenstates that vary as a function of field and orientation. And, right? So you have eigen, eigen, um, vectors and eigenvalues that are dependent on orientation. And you can do that using spin Hamiltonian theory. Uh, and so here's an example of a chromium, uh, chromium spin qubit, again from Dana Friedman's group. And this, you can see, has four levels. So this is spin 3 over 2 ground state, but the zero field splitting means that these are non-degenerate. And because of the mixing between these is not just axial, you have all the rhombic anisotropies, all of these transitions are actually detectable. Okay? And so, uh, and so for example here, we're looking, so this is the Hein echo experiments are two different transitions, and this is the corresponding uh, mutation experiments. So this blue, these blue traces are this transition here, so from our this lowest energy state to this one, so the minus one half to the minus three half. That's a, a an allowed EPR transition. Okay, your delta ms is plus or minus one. Okay, so that is allowed, uh, and that's what this mutation is here. But you can also do it on these formally forbidden transitions, but they're actually not forbidden because you've mixed everything up. You, you no longer are dealing with MS eigenstates, you have all kinds of rhombic anisotropy. And so you then have this red uh, uh, thing. So, so it has less coherence, that's not necessarily because it's uh, rhombic, but it's for other reasons uh, in terms of its um, sensitivity to magnetic fields. You're now dealing with the plus or minus three half transition, so inter inherently that has a bigger um, Zeeman term, right? So you're going to be more sensitive to noise. So you have less coherent time there. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, can you please go back to slide 62? Slide 62. Hi, yeah, I'm Can you yeah. please repeat uh, when we have the BX or BY component of eigenvalue field? Sorry, what was the question? How does it look? <laughs> then we have, this is based on when uh, we consider this aligned magnetic field in Z direction. Yes. So this is SMS basis set, so it's going to right. be... A spin quantization axis is going to be Z direction. So if we have B, X, and B, Y, mm -hmm. how is that? When we have B, X, and B, Y components? Yeah. Well, so this would become a BX or a BY, uh, and so then these green terms would disappear, and BX and BY uh, have terms in the Hamiltonian that correspond to SX and SY, which if you write them in terms of the latter operators are S plus and S minus. So you will then have terms on the first off-diagonal here that will be non-zero. And so your BX and BY in this basis will mix things with delta MS plus minus one. So why we don't have all of them at the same time in this Hamiltonian? Because each molecule is only experiencing one magnetic field vector, right? In, in, any, in any real experiment, I have a molecule. And in the lab frame, I have a fixed magnetic field. And so each molecule is only experiencing one magnetic field, right? So then you, for, for an ensemble of molecules, those will be in different orientations. And so each molecule in its own reference frame will experience a magnetic field in a different direction. So I'm transforming from the lab frame into the molecular frame, yeah? And so depending on which molecule I pick out of my ensemble, it will be feeling a magnetic field in a different direction. Okay, so some molecules will have it perfectly along their local Z frame. Some will have it perfectly along their X frame. Some will have it somewhere in between all of them. And in that context, you just have a linear combination of field, whatever it is, for the direction cosines that your relative field is. For general term, we can consider Vx, Vy, Bz at the same time. And consider well, not at the same time. Well, it depends, right? If, so if you want to simulate an EPR spectrum, you have to simulate all possible orientations of the magnetic field. You integrate over the magnetic field direction with respect to the molecular frame. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so I was going to show a picture, uh, an example of this. Again, my examples haven't worked so far. So this might work, though. OK, so this is chromium, OK? So here we have, this is from Dana's paper, right? So here we have some zero field splitting values. D is 0.326 wave numbers. E is minus 0 0.107. And we have some G values. Um, and so I'm going to plug those into a code, which is called phi, which is one that I wrote. Um, you can use other codes to do this. Easy spin is a popular one. Uh, it's in MATLAB. Uh, that's Stefan Stoll's work. Um, here is the input for, for, for this code if you want to do it. There's examples on my website and things. But here we're saying it's a spin 3 over 2, so you give it 2 times s. Um, we're using a crystal field Hamiltonian to impart the D and E values. We're writing in the G factors. Um, I'm telling it something about the EPR. I want to do a 9.4 gigahertz and a 34 gigahertz experiment. I want to sweep the magnetic field from 0 to 2 Tesla and integrate over not 10 orientations, it's something in the tens of thousands, don't worry about it. Um, and this is the spectrum, right? So you can run this, you know, it doesn't take too long to run. So you can see the progress bar. And then it will pop up at some point with a spectrum. There you go. Okay, so this is how you simulate EPR spectrum. So this is this line, is it integrating over all the field directions? And if I make this too few field directions, it will look very different, right? So, and here below is just the Zeeman spectrum for any orientation. And so here I have the strongest transitions, that's your X-band transition in green, your uh, Q-band transitions, which are in blue. So for any orientation, so in my selection of orientations here, I can move my arrow, my cursor, and go through all the different. So here I am rotating, and here is the, the X, the Y, the Z, or the theta and the phi of where the magnetic field is with respect to the molecular frame. Okay, And so you can see that the eigenvalues are changing, the eigenstates are also changing, where you have resonances are changing. You can see avoided crossings. You can see real crossings. You can see all kinds of fun stuff, right? This is anisotropic higher spin spectra. They're crazy. And they get even wilder than this, depending on what you have going on. Um, and this is why modeling EPR spectra is a real pain in the neck, because you get all these crazy turning points and things where things are on resonance, off resonance, and you have such precise degrees of um, such you know, fine uh, bandwidths in your EPR. So for instance, if I just make this a Z spectrum, right? you'll only get one transition. Why is this telling me something that I can't do it? Field Z. Oh. Warning. No one really does single crystal transitions. <laughs> Warning. There you go. So here now, I've only done one orientation of the magnetic field. And so there are going to be a few different places. So this is the strongest X-band transition, so the strongest intensity. But you see there's also one down here. And that's because this microwave quantum hits a gap here somewhere. Right? It's not shown because it's weaker. Right? This is only picking up the one strongest transition. And for, for Q-band, there's one there. But of course, you'll see one probably fits there, another one fits there, and then another one probably fits somewhere here. Right? So, but that's not what you'll measure in the experiment if you put a sample, of, you know, a macroscopic sample of all orientations of molecules in your spectrometer. You will see something that looks like we saw before. Powder spectrum, which then will give you all those nice curves and bumps and wiggles like that, OK? Yeah? Um, why, what, line, uh, what spectral line shape are you using here? This is Lorentzian. Um, so I tried using like exactly easy spin. And I have had issues with the line width. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes uh, I don't get any intensity, but I just want to have an idea. Like, uh, like is it 2 milli Tesla? No. So this is a whole other thing. Um, the reason I wrote this is because this is what's like this is a brute force spin Hamiltonian numerical simulation, right? So this is actually calculating the spin Hamiltonian for whatever you want as a function of magnetic field, as a function of orientation of the field. So it's expensive, right? It takes a lot of time. I'm actually calculating it and simulating the intensity. What Easy Spin does is it picks an orientation. And then it does a few calculations and in interpolates eigenvalues, tries to find transitions by finding the resonance energy condition, and plots a stick spectrum, and then convolutes the sticks in field space. That's not actually what the experiment does. The experiment works in frequency space, and as a function of field, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors change. So this is a brute force one. So these, these line widths is in gigahertz. This is in a frequency space line width. So this gives you a more accurate line shape profile than Easy Spin does. So if you have problems, it's probably because of this. And how large can you like specify your line width? In you can this, do whatever you want. Uh, 
You can do whatever you want. Oh, okay. So it makes sense to add it. Uh... Right. Like, let me make this shorter so it goes quicker. Uh, so this is just integrating fewer directions. And so now you see wiggles because I've got preferred orientations. I've done a bad powder average. Anyway, um, so that's quicker. But I can, that's a line width of two. I can make it one, and it'll get really sharp and nasty because there's now less, you know, the, the lines are narrower. I can make it really sharp, and it will look stupid. Um, it'll just be crazy, right? So if you have really sharp spectra, you need to integrate a lot because you have very narrow lines. And this is life. Yeah. Wow, this is popular. <laughs> to, to what extent, like, would you use this in, like, a kind of, like, the direction of you have the crystal field already and you haven't done an experiment, or, like, you want to understand an experiment you've already done? Both. Both. You would do it for both. You know, we use this to model EPR spectra to extract zero field splittings and G values. We use this to predict where we'll find transitions in a sample that we know. We, whatever. So then the, the follow-up is, like, to what extent would you use like a simulation to like get crystal field for like an unknown set of compounds, or would you like use an already like known compound with a crystal field splitting? Again, it depends on what you want to do. I mean, you know, this uh, EPR is good for measuring very low energy things because that's microwave energies, right? So these are very small zero field splittings, fractions of a wave number. This is perfect. You will not be measuring lanthanide crystal field splitting energies on the terahertz with EPR. If you want to predict those, you can use ab initio calculations. That works very well. That's the other half of my life. Um, that's fine. It depends what you want to do. Yeah. I'm going to, uh, is it more about EPR fitting and stuff. Uh, just a quick comment about line width. Yep. Uh, in the real world, like, your uh, spectrum should not depend on the line width you choose. So from a computational perspective, we should sort of try different line widths until they don't change by a certain method. The line width is entirely arbitrary because you're right. In, in, in the spectral space, line width doesn't exist apart from lifetime broadening. Right? Um, in reality, though, in, in your experiment, you observe broad lines because you have strain effects, which is essentially you have a distribution of molecular geometries even in a crystal because the crystal isn't perfect, right? There is some distribution of molecule shapes. And so this in, implies a line width, um, which you can't model really any other way than by putting a line width on. I mean, you can actually do, there are ways of you, and putting strain effects on, so you can tell it that there's some uncertainty in these numbers, and it will assume some Gaussian distribution and do a thing. Um, that's another problem. But you're, you're right, fundamentally, spectroscopically, line widths are not real unless they're lifetime broadening, lifetime limited. Yeah. OK. Right, back to the main show. Uh, good. OK. So higher dimensions, they, you know, all these ideas about using multi-level electron spin system goes back really to the early days of quantum computing. So um, Lundberger and Loss, right, in 2001, their paper, Quantum Computing Molecular Magnets, which is great. And everyone cites this and says, oh, we'll use single molecule magnets to do computing. It's great. And I'll tell you why that's not quite true. But they, th this is their quote. I won't read it out. But theoretically, molecular magnets can be used to build dense and efficient memory devices based on the Groger algorithm using manganese 12. And manganese 12 is this really nice single molecule magnet. And it has got 12 manganese ions, manganese 3s and manganese 4s. You have a tetrahedron in the middle that is ferromagnetically coupled to one another. You have a ring around the outside that's ferromagnetically coupled to one another. They anti-ferromagnetically couple, and so you get a spin 10 for this entire molecule. Macroscopic spin for a macroscopic molecule. Uh, that leads to all the different MS uh, eigenstates of this system, and they have different energies because of zero field splitting that, is, that impacts uh, this spin ground state. That leads to magnetic hysteresis, uh, if you want to ask me about that, you can. This is not a talk about single molecule magnets, so I'll kind of skip through that. Um, the coupling is complicated. You can look at this reference of how they've actually measured it recently using inelastic sc uh, neutron scattering, which is really nice. Uh, I'm going to skip through single molecule magnets because it's boring. Right. The point of the Lundberg and Loss uh, paper was to show that, yes, you can use all these energy levels and you can write out really complicated algorithms using crazy pulse sequences to address all of these things, there are a few problems. 
First problem, these energy scales, right? The splitting in this, this is all in the microwave region. So you have to have a, a, a sharp enough transitions and broad enough bandwidth that you can address them all individually. That's problem one. Problem two is that these are all pretty well MS eigenstates. And they've drawn some arrows here that go from 10 to, well, there are a few where they go. There's 10 to 9. There are a few in here. But there are a few of them I think they suggest need to be multiple quantums. And that's a bit of a problem as well for microwaves, OK? Because they're not necessarily very allowed. And so you might have to spend a long time at this really off resonant transition to, to actually turn the spin on that transition. So, you know, yes and no. Um, and the reason, in general, molecular magnets make terrible qubits is because, yes, you can build huge anisotropy in these really well defined quantum states that have very nice MJ eigenvalues. But the problem is with EPR, again, you're only allowed MS plus minus one or MJ plus minus one. So you can only do certain transitions in this manifold. You can't do all of them. Uh, so that makes algorithms pretty limited. And also, if you want to take a really good single molecule magnet, this splitting is now in the terahertz because you've made it really big to make this energy barrier. Again, if you care about single molecule magnets, ask me later. Um, you make an energy barrier really big, you're not doing this with microwaves. And terahertz is a real pain in the frequency spectrum So to do anything with. Um, so it's kind of hard. So single molecule magnets don't make good qubits. That's not true. Okay, I think almost universally. Okay. So what can you do? And this is more work out of uh, Stefano, Stefano Caretta's group based on chemistry from Guillermo group. And this is where they're proposing these sort of three uh, metal lanthanide-based qubits for an eight-dimensional qubit. So two times two times two gives you eight levels. Um, and the idea is you can use this for embedded error correction. Now, I'm no expert on error correction. Other people in the audience will know way more than I do. But the idea here is that you have one central qubit being your, your um, uh, your, your qubit that you care about, and then you're using these two on the sides as ancilla to essentially cor detect, correct um, the, the error. So again, we've seen some quantum circuits over the last few days. Someone else here can tell me what it does. Um, but we have some conditional knots, and we have some rotation, some Y gates, some memory, and then we have a readout on the end here, okay? And so the whole idea here, and this is exactly the, I, the question before, was here you're proposing, here's your CC knot, your control controlled knot at the end, and here's your two controlled knots right there. That's great. But they're occurring at different magnetic fields. So you would have to coherently switch the magnetic field to be on resonance, or have a broad enough resonator that you could hit this transition as well as this one, right? Great proposals, great proposals, practically really hard to implement, in, at least in the EPR gigahertz regime, really hard to implement. But the idea is that, yes, this is some ratio of how good the coherence is or something, but it peaks, right? You can, you can improve um, uh, the, the error rates of these things. And that's, they've generalized this further. This is another paper from the same group. But generalizing this further, showing that the error, I think this is the, some kind of epsilon error, I can't remember. Uh, basically, the larger the spin levels you have, the more degrees of freedom, the, the better you can correct errors. So in general, this is the same idea as the Lewenberg and Loss proposal, that is, if you have many, many levels, you can do some really cool stuff if you can address them, if you can actually do the experiment. So there's a whole lot of really nice um, you know, quantum logic that's been proposed, but now it's the equipment that's lagging behind. So there's a lot of engineering and stuff um, that anyone clever might want to do, um, people in this audience, perhaps. To fix. Okay, how long have I got? Um, half an hour. Okay, great. T1 and T2. Uh, I've got a couple of things right. So, what are T1 and T2? Well, T1 is spin lattice, spin bath, spin phonon coupling. Um, and it's where we have energy exchange between the spin and phonon bath or, or, or environment. And this drives the system towards thermal equilibrium. Okay, and so if you want to have something quantum coherent, you don't want this happening. That's a T1 process. T2, in EPR language, or TM, whatever, is often called the spin-spin relaxation. But essentially, it's just the phase coherence being lost to something in the environment, okay, leading to decoherence. Um, both are really terrible if you want to try and calculate from first principles where they come from and how to stop them. Um, I'll go through a little bit here how some of uh, my group, but also others, are, are dealing with this. Okay. So this is a review we put out just last year. So if you're interested in spin phonon coupling in molecules and understanding T1 processes, this is all talking about lanthanides, but it's all the same physics. Just change J for S, and you're golden. Uh, right, so basically, phonons modulate the electronic Hamiltonian. 
okay, as a function of time. Wiggly bits, wiggle your Hamiltonian, okay? And this leads to absorption, emission, scattering of phonons, because the phonons are somehow interacting with your system. Uh, and so what I've got to write here is a total Hamiltonian for atlanthanide. Okay, so again, you can change this for a spin qubit, doesn't matter. We have the electronic part, so here we have a crystal field Hamiltonian, which is indicating the anisotropy of our environment, generated by the molecule, but this could be D or E, doesn't matter. We have a magnetic field, we then have the phonon bath, and then we have a spin phonon coupling, which here we are talking about how the phonons, the spatial degrees of freedom, manipulate the crystal field parameters, because they are essentially the parts that connect to the orbital angular momentum in a molecule and wiggle with time. So how do the phonons wiggle the crystal field parameters? That's what this is. And therefore, how do they couple the spin degrees of freedom to the phonon degrees of freedom? Okay. And so the spin phonon coupling we are talking about is this first derivative of the crystal field parameters, which we want to somehow use in a useful way. And so if we're only talking about T1 type relaxation, so this is the sort of population transfer processes, we're not talking about coherences, then we can get away with doing rate equations. And it works really well, okay? So single phonon absorption and emission processes are simple, uh, back, back to Fermi's golden rule, okay? If you have an oscillating term in your Hamiltonian, okay, call this your V term, it's oscillating with this parameter, whatever, um, at the frequency of the phonon mode, then you can say it's going to generate a transition between two eigenstates of your, um, of your system Hamiltonian. So this is essentially a reduced, we've, we've gone all the way past Redfield, we've traced out the bath, if anyone is an open quantum system person, we've gone rid of all those degrees of freedom, we're talking about the populations of your spin states only. Okay, so, that, so this, the, these oscillations can generate transition probabilities, which are weighted by, of course, the occupation factors of your bath, which we assume, assume is in thermal equilibrium. So this is a Markovian type bath with no memory, um, there's a resonant, obviously, energy condition here, uh, and then there's some line shape or lifetime of our phonon modes. And we integrate then over all phonon modes and line shapes. Okay, Raman processes, so the equivalent of the optical Raman process is a two phonon scattering terms. These are a heck of a lot more complicated. This is one out of several terms, but essentially this is a, a, another order in perturbation theory. So here we're saying how does one phonon um, mix a state and then how does that second phonon take the mixed state and transmit to your final state, okay? So this is initial to final state via some intermediate state C in perturbation by our, uh, by our phonons. So this is, again, one of several terms. It's just to illustrate that it's a bit of a pain in the neck to do, but it's all possible, even when you're just calculating rates. Um, right, so luckily, though, these integrals, which are over the phonon frequencies, are heavily weighted by these Bose-Einstein occupation factors, and there's two of them now, two phonons, and so this damps all, all the stuff we care about to very, very low energy modes, if we're talking about these, these kind of relaxation processes. Uh, and so we don't have to think about the tens of thousands or in, almost infinite number of phonons in a molecular crystal, we can only have to really worry about the low energy ones for these two phonon processes. Okay, but we still need some idea of what these line shapes are, and that's some of the work that we've been doing. So I'm going to get into phonons. I don't know who cares about phonons, but I think it's interesting. And I think it's important if you're talking about T1 processes because everyone has phonons, right? Even in, even in superconducting qubits, you've got these degrees of freedom, these environmental things, right? And at some point, it's wobbling things in the environment, right? And that's what phonons are. Um, so in molecular crystals, you can actually calculate um, these things, what the line widths of phonon modes are, their lifetimes. And so to do this, we were looking at a single molecule magnet, not a qubit, but that's another story. Um, and to do this is actually really painful, but you can make it a bit easier for yourself if you choose something that has relatively high symmetry and relatively small molecular size. So we looked at this particular single molecule magnet from uh, Ming Liang Tong's group here. Uh, and it's got a relatively high symmetry space group um, with only a few hundred atoms in the primitive cell. But understanding molecular phonons is a bit of a pain. So before I show you the spectrum of that molecule, I want to show you a really simple molecular phonon spectrum. So this is crystalline ammonia. So a really simple molecule. Um, so sort of, yeah, the simplest one we could think of that showed all the interesting features. So molecular vibrations you might be familiar with. We've heard about this from Nick in the gas phase. You know, you have high energy intramolecular modes that do all kinds of stuff. They still occur in the solid state, of course. You have NH vibrations. These things are high energy right, thousands of wave numbers. So these aren't really interesting for, for spin relaxation processes at cryogenic temperatures. They're there, fine. 
as you go, these are bending sort of scissoring modes and all kinds. But when you get to the really low energy, that's when things start getting interesting. So of course, in, for a gas phase molecule, in the, in the pure gas phase, you have 3n minus 6 degrees of freedom. 3n because you have three Cartesian coordinates for every atom, minus 6 because transla translational modes, three Cartesian translations, don't give you any, any energy change for a gas phase molecule. And also, there are three rigid rotations, which don't give you any energy change. So minus 6 for, for a gas phase. But when you're in the condensed phase, all of those modes, those, those molecular motions and, and rotations, are no longer zero energy, right? Because you have neighbors. And there is some intermolecular energy that comes with all of these. So these are called the external modes of molecules. And in the solid state, they all are there. And they're all non-zero. And so they all map into this really low energy region. So there is still three modes, actually, that are zero energy. And that's when all of the molecules in your crystal, your infinite periodic crystal, move in the same direction. Right? And you can do that three different directions. These are called the acoustic modes. And they do nothing. They are zero energy at the gamma point. And the gamma point in reciprocal space is just where every unit cell is doing the same thing. Right? So if we all stand in a line and we all do this in the same way, that's the gamma point. If we all do this and we're standing in a line, but we do it out of phase with one another, that's a non-zero energy process. And that's where we move off the gamma point. So in reciprocal space, you can think about that as like, the, so these vectors are in reciprocal space. I don't know if you've seen these, these diagrams before with different wave vectors. But essentially, you can think about it as what are the neighboring unit cells doing? How, how off phase are they from your canonical central unit cell? Um, so that's what, the, that's what reciprocal space is. And so these three modes have exactly zero energy at the gamma point, because that's the entire crystal moving, and nothing, nothing changes energy. But as soon as you start doing the same motion, but your unit cells are doing different things, it's non-zero. And so these are the acoustic modes. They are linear at, um, as you approach the gamma point. This is the origin of the Debye model of acoustic phonons, if anyone's come across that in condensed matter physics. Um, which says, let's assume the acoustic modes are linear. That gives you a quadratic density of states. Okay, you may have seen all this before. This is the Debye model. And then if you integrate here up to the value of 3, that's your acoustic modes. And then for Debye-like spectra, it stops. And that's our Debye temperature. Okay, all that stuff. Yeah, well, in reality, it's a bit more complicated than that because you have these optical phonon modes, technically. Anything that's non-zero at the gamma point is an optical mode. Um, and they can be really low energy. So here we're only a few hundred wave numbers, but these are already interacting with the, with the acoustic modes off the gamma point. And so they mix, right? You have all these avoided crossings. And so really off the gamma point, there's no such thing as an optic mode or an acoustic mode. They're just all modes. Okay, so it's complicated. And you get these kind of spectra that are all crazy. This is what you deal with in molecules, and it's painful. So this is, this is crystalline ammonia. This is the simplest one. Um, of course, when you go to more complicated molecules, it's nastier. So at low temperatures, I call these, these things the pseudo-acoustic modes, because for, for as far as I'm concerned, they're still just these rigid body translations or rotations of molecules in a lattice. So to me, these are kind of acoustic, wibbly-wobbly, low-energy things, right? And they all mix, so it's kind of irrelevant anyway. But these are the ones that are populated at low temperatures. These are the ones that are important um, in, your, in your low temperature spin dynamics that you want to understand, or at least model. And the optic ones, yes, we care about them at high temperatures, but depends on your experiment. OK, any questions on phonon modes for molecular crystals? Because I've gone through that incredibly quickly. Because I still haven't even got to the fun part about molecular spin qubits. So you're using yeah. a Dubai model then? Nope. Like, like you're using the whole? Yeah. Yeah. We calculate. So this is a first principles calculation for the energies of the phonon modes of the molecular crystal of ammonia as a function of sampling reciprocal space. We know all of the energies. And you put that into your very other rule rates? Not for ammonia, because I don't care about ammonia. But what I do care about is this molecule. So this is the phonon dispersion and the phonon density of states for that dysprosium molecule, which is a heck of a lot denser because it's a bigger, floppier molecule with a metal in the middle. Now, this is a painful calculation. Actually, this one wasn't too painful. This is not so bad. But when you have bigger molecules, lower symmetry, larger unit cells, and you can't, as chemists, you like to control the molecular geometry. You can't control how the damn things crystallize, right? They just crystallize in a way. 
and you can play with maybe solvents or counter ions and try and make it do different things, but really that's a black art and you'll be just chance, you know, chancing your luck. Um, so this is what it is for this particular crystal, right? It's really dense. You can see our, uh, um, our gamma point acoustic modes there, um, but everything else is just horrible. But we calculated all of it. Okay, and this is the full phonon spectrum up to higher energies. Um, and what we also did with this particular molecular crystal is calculate the lifetimes of all the phonon modes throughout reciprocal space. And so this is a plot of, well, this is a, a plot of the line width, which is inversely proportional to the lifetime, if you care about that, um, of the phonon modes. And you can see that these are not constant. They vary a heck of a lot across energy and a heck of a lot across reciprocal space. All the different colors are different points in reciprocal space. So there's a lot of dispersion in phonon lifetimes, a lot of dispersions in, in their lifetimes as a function of energy. It, it's terrible. So this dotted line is one theory, which is not quite right, right? It's crazy. And that allows you to calculate realistic density of states that account for the, the exact lifetimes. You were asking about lifetimes. This is actually the, the phonon scattering limited lifetimes. And you can use that as opposed to an artificial broadening to calculate a real density of states that takes into account all of the phonon scattering processes. Okay. So you can do this. Again, this is incredibly pain. These are painful calculations. Um, then, once you've done all that, you need to calculate the spin phonon coupling for all your vibrational modes for your molecular crystal. And so a very, very talented student of mine, Jakob, who's finishing up now and is not staying with me for a postdoc, but that is the nature of life. Everyone must move on at some point. Um, but he was great, and basically he came up with a way of using this linear vibronic coupling model, which is a big thing in um, non-adiabatic dynamics. We heard a little bit about that, looking at these sort of um, uh, conical intersections and how you do intersystem crossing in, f in, in, in higher sort of optical decay processes. That's this stuff that people are using. So these are the non-adiabatic couplings here. Um, Right? These are what you can calculate between different eigenstates using quantum chemistry methods. And then you have your gradients, which are the diagonal terms. So this is just telling you how are your wiggly bits, degrees of freedom, mixing your electronic states. That's what it's asking. Um, and the great thing about this is these methods are implemented for a single shot. So at the equilibrium geometry of our molecular crystal, we can get all the gradients and non-adiabatic couplings. And what Jakob did is work out a way is how to convert those into our spin Hamiltonian basis. So we can map directly all of our phonon degrees of freedom to get the spin phonon coupling constants for everything. Oh, uh, do we need the Hessian, uh, do we still need the Hessian properties for the, uh, from the standard DFT calculation, or we just need the gradient? Yeah. So the Hessian at the DFT level gives you all the phonon modes, right? Uh, yeah, so, yes. so those phonon modes are still calculated by those methods like in the DFPT or something. Uh, uh, yes, basically. We, we actually use finite differences for those phonon modes. Yeah, so, so those phonon are previously got and acquired, and so maybe what kind of properties here? So here we're using, so that's the next part, which is we are now using, if we want to understand how the electronic de degrees of freedom are impacted by phonon modes, we have F electrons. We can't use DFT to obtain the magnetic sublevels. We are using complete active space self-consistent field methods. So we're using multi-reference or multi-determinental calculations, not unlike what you heard about yesterday, except we're not assuming a single determinant reference and then applying excitations to obtain correlation. We are directly writing out a multi-determinental correlated wave function in the ground state and hoping that's good enough, <laughs> which works for most things, but not everything. Um, so that's what we're doing here. We're doing a complete active space calculation on a dysprosium that's embedded in the center of an electrostatic model of the crystal environment, which you actually have to use a conductor screening model. Again, ask me if you're interested. It's really cool. Um, it's all described in this recent paper. Um, but you can show that it converges, that your electronic eigenstates converge as a function of um, uh, the size of this environment, uh, and that, that all the spin phonon couplings converge as well. And all of that, you roll it all up, you do some fun stuff, you solve Fermi's golden rule, you use the second order, blah, 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 and you get this. So you can do it all. It took, so, took us a long time to work out all the pieces, but the black dots are the experiment. So this is essentially T1 as a function of temperature for this molecular magnet crystalline uh, sample measured by experiment. Uh, and the red and pink lines are our calculation. Okay, so there's no fitting parameters. That's all just ab initio. Um, and so we think now we can do this for pretty much any molecular crystal that's a nice enough crystal that lets you calculate the phonon modes. 
Of course, you're still limited by having to obtain those things. And sometimes crystal, some crystals are just pigs, and you can't do it. Um, no matter you ask very nicely for the biggest computer that the UK has, it still doesn't work. Um, maybe the US has got a bigger one. I don't know. Anyway, I haven't found one big enough yet to solve one of the problems. It doesn't matter. It's like quantum computers are being invented. Hey? It's why we invented quantum computers. Yeah, well, yeah. Get me a quantum computer that'll solve the vibrational Hamiltonian of a ridiculous crystal. That'll be great. Exactly right. I love it how it's this cyclic thing that we need quantum chemistry and classical computers to solve the problems we need to solve quantum computers to solve the... <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it keeps everyone employed. <laughs> okay? Classical and quantum physicists alike, and chemists, it seems. Very good. Okay. Uh, oh, so much stuff. Okay, um, T2. T2 is magnetic noise, right? It spins flip-flopping in environment, causing wiggly bits in your Zeeman term that you don't like. Um, this is work, again, from Steve Hill, looking at that Holmium uh, clock qubit. And this is really cool. This is what they're doing is Hanako experiments here around the clock transition. And what's really neat is when you're on the clock transition, it's this nice decay, exponential decay. And when you're away from the clock transition, you've got lots of wiggles. And these wiggles we saw a little bit before. I didn't really go into it. This is what's called E-seam. And essentially, this is beating of the nuclear spin frequency on the electron spin manifold. Okay, so this, this oscillation here is the nuclear Lamour frequency. Um, and that's fine. So here you go. So you do a Fourier transform of, of, of the oscillating part of this thing, uh, and you get these terms. So here is your, um, that is your proton Lamour frequency is a function of this magnetic field, okay? And then you have two times the proton Lamour frequency, you have a harmonic there, no problems. And this is the, the Fourier transform, okay? So you can map all those things out from experiment, perfect. But let's see if we can use that, you know, can we do a model of this? And so what they did is crazy. They took a spin one, now this is a holmium, it's not a spin one, it's a J8 with a nuclear spin and all kinds of crazy stuff. But that's kind of details, right? So take a spin one, you apply a, a made up zero field splitting Hamiltonian that puts your MS zero away and you're left with an MS plus minus one, okay? It's non Kramer's spin one. So now apply an E, which splits your degeneracy just like the low symmetry crystal field splits your MJ degeneracy in this holmium thing, and you have a little avoided crossing. So you can mimic a, a, a clock transition, okay? Then you can place fictional spin one halves corresponding to nuclear spins at some distance that corresponds to the hyperfine coupling they observe in the experiment. So just pick your R so that your hyperfine matches, okay? Do that. Um, and then just add unitary evolution and hit some pulse sequences and see what happens. And funnily enough, they get almost exactly the behavior they see in the experiment. Like, I'm going to flash now to, this is the theory. That's the experiment. That's the theory. That's the experiment. Like, you can see these, these Fourier transform frequencies. It's almost identical, right? And they haven't done anything special apart from say, okay, our hyperfine is this many megahertz. Let's put some spins this many megahertz away. Um, let's take a spin one. And what's the, what's the gap? Oh, it's this much? Okay, let's, that, that's our E term. Okay, run some coherent. Oh, it's exactly the experiment, right? So even with a really finite number, stupidly small, discrete number of nuclear spins, you can model the effect of the, the loss of coherence to a nuclear spin bath, right? So this is what it is. And you can do way more advanced stuff. I think Haiping Cheng in Florida has done some really good uh, mean field type experiments on this, and there's old theory as well. It's really cool, um, but it's so obvious, right? Uh, and the, the obvious thing is here as well with the finite system, is if you let this run longer, it decays, and then of course at some point in time, it comes back because it's a finite spin system and everything is coherent always. So decoherence is the loss of, of your local coherence to a bath. It doesn't go away, it's just moved. So if you had an entirely universally coherent wave function, we're all golden and we don't need to worry, but well, that's not life. Okay. Do you happen to know what that distance is? is this that slice? distance? Yeah. That they slice. model, I mean, th so basically it's the- Next nearest neighbor. Well, no, so this is basically the water protons in the environment. So the distance in physical space is like probably mm, maybe 10 angstrom, so a nanometer, roughly. Because I think these are on the order of, say, 80, 80 megahertz. No, it's less than that. It could be way less than that. I can't remember off the top of my head how many megahertz. It's, it's weak. Maybe it's like one megahertz or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay, so let's take a step back to Givincenzo. Oh, my goodness. Um, right, 
So what are we doing for initialization? We've talked about these things. Yeah, okay. Molecules maybe can do some of these things if you really care. But here's a big one. How are we initializing? And really with all this EPR stuff, it's just Boltzmann, which kind of sucks, right? Because even at low temperature, you're not having a good time. You're only dealing with a very small amount of your sample being polarized. Um, right, so what are the, what is, how will people do it in, in real quantum computing or real quantum information science applications? So NV, well, this is nice. NV has this beautiful optical spectra where you can use fluorescence to, at room temperature, polarize your electron spin, right? Um, I'm not going to go through all of this. If you want to talk about it later, we can do it. Um, but it's really cool. So can you make an analog of this in molecules? And the answer is yes. Um, and Dana Friedman illustrated this beautifully um, with some experiments that she did with David Ashalam at Chicago. Um, and so this is a chromium molecule. Okay, this is chromium-4, not chromium-3. So chromium-4 has two unpaired electrons, and she's made an octahedral, uh, sorry, a, a tetrahedral environment. And the really crucial thing here is in a tetrahedron, your EG sub-manifold of D orbitals is lower than your T2G. So your ground D2 configuration is a triplet A, which means you have a spin of one in your ground state. Okay? And the really neat part of this chemistry is that these are carbon chromium bonds. And these carbon chromium bonds are very strong. So you have a strong crystal field splitting. So as opposed to your excited term being this uh, triplet T, because you've made one excitation of the spin from the lower EG to the upper T2G, you now have a triply degenerate orbital moment, which conveys orbital um, degeneracy and anisotropy, not what you want. Um, by making a strong crystal field, you actually make it so that this gap is too large. And the first excited state is actually this singlet E. Okay, So that's the really cool thing, is that your, sing, your, your triplet ground state has a singlet excited, first excited state. So that's really nice chemistry. And that all goes back to Tanabe Sugano diagrams and all the fun stuff. So we can talk about that. Oh, here's a picture. Here you go. This is a Tanabe Sugano diagram. So it's showing you, as a function of the crystal field splitting, what are the energies of your terms. Okay? So the triplet A is your ground state. And conventionally, this triplet T is your first excited state until you get to such a strong field that the, that the singlet E becomes your first excited state. So that's how you read a Tanabe Sugano diagram if you've never seen one. But they're fun. They're useful. OK, so that's cool chemistry that makes that happen. What's the spin physics or the laser physics here? So if you use an off-resonant excitation from the ground state, you go up to all kinds of things. But you can observe the fluorescence, okay, the photoluminescence. And there's a really sharp line here. So we're only going to be talking about this first compound here at around about 1024 nanometers. Okay? And that's photoluminescence to these levels there. So that measures how far this is. And with a narrow enough line laser, you can do a resonant excitation from the 0 ms projection to this higher lying spin singlet. And then you can obviously see photoluminescence back. right? But the photoluminescence is not necessarily resonant. It's spontaneous. right? So sometimes it'll go to your 0 states, and sometimes it'll go to your plus or minus 1 states. And so what you do is by repeatedly hitting it with an on-resonant drive, you can pump it out of this ms0. So this is all the optical cycling kind of stuff we saw before. So you can drive it into this higher lying um, uh, metastable plus minus one MS levels. So you can enhance your population there. And so the contrast and optical contrast is about 14% here in this experiment, which is enough to do some fun stuff. So this is initialization, right? You can put it into a defined spin manifold. And then you can hit it with microwaves that mix your MS0 and plus or minus one states and drive resonant transitions between these. And so as a function of the magnetic field with an applied microwave, you can see the photoluminescence in this experiment is now shifting just with the Zeeman energies. Beautiful, beautiful experiment here. And so you can directly measure the zero field splitting and all kinds of things. What else can you do with this? Well, you can initialize it. So by using a resonant optical initialization step, you can get, drive it into the MS1 states, MS plus minus one. You can then wait a little bit of time so you get uh, thermalization in your plus minus one states, hit it with a microwave pulse, and you can then measure your uh, photoluminescence again. And so you can do this, so this is called optically detected magnetic resonance, because you're using an optical response to detect the result of your magnetic resonance experiment. Okay, so ODMR. Um, and so you can hear they're measuring the, the change in photoluminescence, and you can see that it's coherently oscillating as a function of uh, the power of the applied uh, microwaves. And they can also do a Hahn echo experiment in the middle of this thing and measure the T2, which is on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. So that's pretty cool. That's engineering molecules to act like NV centers. Nice. 
And there's a whole lot of follow-ups on that, which is cool as well. Right, we are getting towards the pointy end of things, so I am going to go through this. Um, what's the coolest experiment that's been done on a molecular qubit? Um, so, terbium bisphalocyanin was a single molecule magnet, the first single iron magnet, if you will. It has this sort of sandwich environment which puts the plus or minus six MJ sublevels of terbium lowest energy. But it's non kramers so depending on the symmetry, these might be slightly uh, non-degenerate. Okay? But it acts as a pseudo one-half like we talked about before. So that was synthesis originally from Japan, Naoto Ishikawa. Um, but if you take that and you put it in a device, can you do something cool with it? And so this is work from um, uh, Wolfgang Wernstorfer, who was in Grenoble and then moved to Karlsruhe um, a few years ago. But this is taking the terbium bisphalocyanin qubit and putting it into a break junction. So this is a gold nano junction where you start putting a current, well actually I don't know if it was electromigration or it was break, it doesn't matter. You've made a small hole between two gold electrodes by a number of different main, means. And if you wash a solution of molecules over it, chances are eventually you might find a molecule falls into a gap. And that's exactly what they did. And so you can measure the conductivity of this thing, but you can do that in a variable magnetic field. Okay, so here's the schematic. They have a source electrode, a drain electrode, so two gold wires, and essentially they are measuring conductivity through a molecule. And so what happens physically is an electron tunnels onto the molecule, spends a bit of time, and then jumps off again. Okay, so tunneling electrons through this. And so they call that electron that jumps onto the molecule their readout dot. It's a quantum dot, it's a spin, whatever, sits on the molecule for some time and then leaves again. Now, that extra electron spin that sits on the the organic parts of these ligands, okay? This is just a schematic, that's not an actual picture, right? Okay. They don't know which direction the molecule is a priori. That's a cartoon, okay. Um, so the electron jumps onto those ligands, the, the organic parts, and sits there for some time. When it's sitting there, it's going to have a magnetic coupling through the terbium spin, right? It's pretty much on top of it. So it's, there's an exchange coupling to this terbium spin, which is well defined at very low temperatures by the plus and minus six total angular momentum projection. Okay, so there's some exchange coupling. That terbium uh, electron spin is actually also hyperfine coupled to its nuclear spin, which is I3 over 2. And so you have this two-level decoupling that he likes to talk about. Okay. Uh, and what you can do is apply a gate that manipulates the electron spin cloud, which changes your hyperfine coupling. And so you can gate this interaction um, separately. Okay, so this is the sort of schematic of their device. That's the ligand. That's the hyperfine. Great. Now, hyperfine levels. We have two electron spin levels, that's these two sort of large things in a cross, but we have four nuclear spin projections, and so those are the different colors. Um, so it actually turns out, so when you, when you have a single molecule, right, you only have one, your molecule is only in one of these states. We don't have a Boltzmann distribution, that's all gone. You have one molecule, it's somewhere, right, as a, at whatever field you are, it's in one of these eight levels. Now, if you magnetize it, so you go very far to one end, you're in one of these four. Okay. And what actually turns out is if you look very closely at these levels here, just like we saw in the clock qubit, um, they are avoided crossings. They're not actual crossings because the symmetry is such that there is a non-degeneracy even when you drive the field to the point where it should be. And so you have these avoided crossings. And so what happens is that when you drive the molecule through these transitions, it can spin flip. Right? The electron spin can flip. And it turns out when the spin flips, on the electron, because the electron is coupled to the extra dot that you're jumping on through conductivity via the exchange coupling, right? When the electron on the terbiums flip, your conductivity changes. So as you're scanning the magnetic field and you're measuring conductivity continuously, you see a jump whenever the molecule spin flips. Okay, so you're reading out a single spin flip in a single molecule of the electron spin. That's cool, that's cool, but actually it's deterministic at which magnetic field the conductivity jumps because depending on which nuclear spin state it's in, they jump at different magnetic fields. So by scanning the magnetic field, you can measure, oh, the conductivity jumped at minus 50 millitesla, I must be in the plus three over two nuclear spin state for that one molecule in the middle of my device. And you sweep it again and it jumps somewhere else. Okay, the nuclear spin is definitely in this state. You're projecting which eigenstate of the nuclear spin you're in, right, with this measurement. And so this is, uh, this is readout, and this is uh, initialization, okay? So by sweeping the magnetic field, you initialize it, and you know what nuclear spin state you're in. 
Then you can use some, mag some microwave or, or whatever, right, frequency to manipulate between your nuclear spin degrees of freedom. You've got four of them. Then you can sweep it back and read out where you ended up, project back onto the nuclear spin states. And so that's exactly what they do. And you can show there, they can show, you can drive Rabi oscillations, which are nice and coherent over very long time scales because it's a nuclear spin. Yeah, <laughs> not talking about electron spin. We're using the electron spin as our interface to, to interrogate and manipulate the, electro, the uh, nuclear spins. Okay, so at different frequencies and whatever, you can show coherent oscillation. Next step. All right, so that was, you know, if you're keeping track, numerous nature and science papers over the last 10 years. Like, this is cool science, even without doing cool things. Right, then, and this is all on the same one molecule in one device, right? Um, all right, so now that you've done this, you can actually do some cool stuff. So the radio frequency, microwave, whatever you want to call this, low gigahertz, okay? Um, and these are your different nuclear spin levels at some finite external magnetic field. So once you sweep through and you're at some nuclear spin state, at a fixed external magnetic field, you can hit it with different microwaves, pulses, okay, or radio frequency. And this allows you to drive different transitions. So again, here's a schematic of our picture where you're going to interface with some drive field. And what you can do then is drive those different transitions. So here we are with these different colored transitions. So we're going from lower to, to first, which is our red, first to second, green, uh, third to fourth with, um, with blue. So here we are driving these coherent oscillations at different frequencies between different um, energy levels. And so in the rotating frame, the resonant drive field is just an off-diagonal, right? Pretty straightforward. And, and the matrix element magnitude there is just going to be the Rabi frequency that you are driving with, right? So that depends on the power um, of your applied field, also on the matrix elements and the blah, 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 but yeah, details. That's your rotating Hamiltonian, okay? So that's dictated by the, by the microwave power. Cool, so they want to perform the Grover algorithm in a single molecule. So what do you do? I, I'm no expert, someone else probably knows more about Grover than I do, but the first step is a Hadamard gate. So you need to generate a coherent superposition. And so we're now in a Hamiltonian space where we have four dimensions amongst these four different levels, and I can drive these three different transitions with different frequencies at whatever our Rabi rates I like. I can also detune those pulses, and the detuning in the rotating frame is essentially a dressing of those states with a certain frequency. So you can detune your, your um, oscillating term by some amount small delta here, okay, so that's our uh, small tuning, which allows you to put these diagonal elements. So these are essentially adding phase shifts to your diagonal terms, okay? So you can detune your frequencies, and so you can show by either between uh, just two sublevels here or by between three of them, you can drive them into coherent superposition states via a Hadamard gate using multi-frequency radio pulses or microwave, whatever it is, in the gigahertz, okay? So you can, by, by hitting whatever pulse tone you like, you can do these superpositions. You can demonstrate a fourth one. I uh, don't think I showed it. It's a bit more complicated for, for putting all four states in, so they focus on just the three. Um, but you can show two or three states becoming all uh, in a superposition. Right, step two of the Grover algorithm, Grover algorithm is when you have a coherent superposition of all your states, you hit that system with a drive frequency that dictates which term you want to pull out. So this is the, the searching of the database, blah, blah, blah. All states are mixed, I want this state, you drive it at the frequency and you pull out that state. Okay, and so that's what they do. You can drive it with a specific uh, pulse sequence that will pull out the population of the state that you want, whether it's this black one, whether it's this red one, or the green one. You can drive it from a superposition into the state that you want uh, via this mutation experiment. And so here's the total sequence, which is the Hadamard, followed by this second set of pulses. So essentially, you drive, I've just added this on in the figure for illustrative purposes, you drive it to the superposition state, and then you drive it into whichever one you want. So this is pretty awesome. This is several years ago, and this is on a single molecule, one in one device, the one molecule that they studied for about a decade. And then it warmed up, and the molecule walked away, and the experiment stopped, which is very sad. I do hope they are making new devices, because this is the coolest thing, right? This is the only single molecular qubit algorithm that anyone's run on, a, on one measurable qubit, okay? Right, I am almost out of time.
But this is like a quote they have at the end, which I love. You know, the great diversity of available molecular magnets with inherent tunability will potentially provide higher nuclear spin values to make accessible databases bigger for molecular quantum computation. Uh, it's a lovely quote. There's another quote, the, the Lundberg and Loss quote's lovely as well. You know, and this is all true stuff. It's just really hard, right? But the fun thing is that, you know, imaginations are pretty powerful things. And if you can think about a way of getting around some of these barriers, then why not try it, right? And this is the whole point. You know, crazy experiments are motivated by crazy people, and that's awesome. And, uh, you know, my ambition is to see way more cool stuff like this happen. Not that I'm going to do it, because, you know, I'm not that clever. Um, but some of you are, probably. Um, this is my last slide. This is just another very recent off the, off the, hot off the press from Stefano Caretta's group. Um, this is showing some coherent control and multi-tone initialization and uh, algorithm implementation on this uh, Iterbium Trensal qubit. They're using this Stigula 173 nuclear spin value and using, again, the nuclear spin degrees of freedom. So you can show, you can drive coherent oscillations at these different tones, which are different transitions amongst this manifold here. Um, don't ask me why they picked those three. I haven't asked them. There'll be a reason. Technically, it's easier or something. Um, right, you can drive Rabi oscillations, and they can simulate tunneling in a molecular magnet by using this uh, type of setup, by hitting it at three different pulses. Uh, I have lots of stuff. It's, I'm out of time. They initialize just by doing some, some tricks. But again, ask me if you're interested. Rotate some stuff. They can show it's nice. Anyway, this is a really nice paper. Go and read it. Um, but th again, this is an, on, on, an ensemble. This is, not, this is not pulling out individual qubits. But it's using multiple levels of a molecular qubit to implement some kind of Hamiltonian that they want to model the dynamics of. And they're sort of running it right via the coherent evolution of the molecular states, which is pretty cool. Right, so that's all I have to say. Um, there's a whole bunch of good reading material if you're interested, people doing um, you know, calculations of spin phonon, people writing about why molecules are great, people doing great experiments. So there's a lot out there and a lot of stuff still to be done. So I hope I've put some interest out there for all of you. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to take any more questions or whenever later on.